Deputy Prime Minister Richard Miles was one of the Labour ministers singled out for criticism by Paul Keating today. As Defence Minister, he has direct responsibility for the nuclear submarine programme. Richard Miles joins me now live from Perth. Richard Miles, welcome to the programme. Good evening, Sarah. Let's start with your response to Paul Keating's accusation that you and Penny Wong influenced the Prime Minister to make the worst international decision by a Labour government in 100 years. Well, whatever Paul Keating uh, says about myself, the Foreign Minister, the Prime Minister, you won't hear a bad word from us about him. I mean, the Hawke Keating government was uh, the great peacetime reformist long-term government in our history. It's a government that finished in 1996. And our responsibility is to be governing the country in the national interest in 2023. And I'd want to make the point, Sarah, that you know, we inherited, um, when we came to office, a set of international relations which were in, in large measure broken. Uh, Penny Wong has been responsible for repairing them. Penny Wong has done more in respect of putting an emphasis on our relations with the Pacific than any foreign minister. Within a year, she really is one of the great foreign ministers we've had. And I don't think we've seen a prime minister uh, walk the international stage so comfortably and so easily, so quickly as Anthony Albanese. He is actually the person who stabilised our relations with China, but he understands the importance of getting the hard power equation right. That's what we're doing here. And for my part, it's really the, the honour of my professional life to be serving with both of them. Nonetheless, the former PM's scathing attack on his Labour colleagues, on the intelligence community, on the military, is unprecedented. He's calling your competence into question and saying essentially that you've put the country in peril. Has he in any way shaken your confidence that you've done the right thing? Uh, not at all. I mean, our national security today and our strategic interests lie in the global rules-based order. One of the great achievements of, of the Hawke-Keating government was to open our economy up and to see us become much more connected with the world. And that's been to the great uh, benefit of our economy and the prosperity of the Australian people. But what it means in a practical sense is that today, you know, in 2020, 45% of our GDP was based on trade. Back in 1990, it was 32. You know, the, the, the practical implication of that, Sarah, is that in the 1990s, we had eight refineries which were, pro were producing the majority of the liquid fuels for our country. Today, we have just two. We import the vast majority of our liquid fuels from overseas. In fact, most of them come from one country in Singapore. Now, there's you no, don't have to no, think very yes, hard. There's no but question. Just, can, yes, but please, can I just finish ahead. that point? Yes. You don't have to think very hard about what it would mean for that one trade line, that one trade route to be mm. disrupted. So it is wrong to be thinking in terms of our vital Vital national interest being confined simply to the continent. Our interest lies in the rules of the road, our connection to the world and the collective security of our region. And that's what this capability will help provide. Paul Keating's argument is based on the assertion that China does not pose a threat to Australia. Has your government decided the opposite? Well, no, we've, we've sought to stabilise our relationship with China and we've worked hard at that. Um, we uh, want to have a productive relationship with China. But, but we do observe that we are seeing the biggest conventional military build-up in the world today since the end of the Second World War. I mean, in, in, in the year 2000, China had six nuclear-powered submarines. By the end of this decade, uh, they're expected to have 21. Uh, in the year 2000, China had 57 major surface vessels. Uh, by the end of this decade, they will have 200. What we're doing is over the next 30 years, replacing our six conventional submarines with eight nuclear powered submarines. Well, let me ask you a That's question what about, we're doing. Let me ask you a question about that. Does the government intend to commit to using this new submarine fleet only in defence of Australia, or could they be used in an offensive way as part of a larger US fleet operation? Well, well firstly, there's been a whole lot of commentary about the sovereignty of these submarines. Let me be really clear. The moment I think there that is wasn't a question about but, no, no, directly but, but about could, sovereignty. It's about defence versus an, an offensive operation, part of a larger part of a larger fleet operation run by the US. 
Yes, but if, as soon as you start talking about uh, operations run by the US, it raises the question of our sovereignty and our decision making in respect of our assets. And I want to be really clear about this. The moment these submarines have an Australian flag upon them is the moment that they are completely commanded by Australia and what they do is determined by us. And do you commit um, that they are for the defence of Australia rather than uh, to take part in offensive operations in uh, the Indo-Pacific? The, the strategic intent uh, of these submarines is absolutely about the defence of Australia and, and we've engaged in a massive diplomatic effort over the last few months and particularly over the last week where between the Foreign Minister, myself, the Prime Minister, the, the Minister for the Pacific, we've made more than 60 calls to within our region, uh, ASEAN, the Pacific regional leaders to make clear what our strategic intent is and, and that is to provide for the collective security of our region and the underpinning of the rules-based order because that's where our, our interests lie. So the defence of Australia doesn't really mean that much today in, in, in the context of the way in which we are connected to the world unless we are seeing the collective security of our region and the maintenance of the global rules-based order. And that is a very different circumstance to the 1990s. And this capability is the most important capability that we will have in terms of making our contribution to that regional security and to underpinning that order. Well, there could be indeed many flashpoints for conflict if strategic competition worsens, obviously, particularly in Taiwan. Now, I just want to put this to you. The Admiral of the US Navy told the US Congress last year that the US will require a robust force presence in Australia, along with Japan, Guam and the Philippines, to, and I quote, effectively defend Taiwan against attack by mainland China. This is last year. That sounds like we are part of their plan to defend their interests. Well, um, firstly, what we're doing in terms of the acquisition of these submarines is, is around the collective security of the region, maintenance of the global rules-based order in the way in which I've described. Uh, scenarios around Taiwan are really quite separate to this. Uh, you know, in, in respect of Taiwan, we've made it clear that we, we don't want to see uh, any alteration to the status quo across the Taiwan Straits. And, and that what really matters here, in, in, in line with what I've just said, is that the rules of the road as they uh, uh, apply uh, to the region also apply to the region around Taiwan. I mean, that, that, that's where our interest lies. But in terms of any future scenario in respect of Taiwan, I mean, that obviously has to be assessed at the, at the time. And that's really a separate issue uh, to what we are deciding today and what we decided yesterday, which is about giving our country the capability to be much more self-reliant going into the future and giving our country an ability to maintain our safety for decades to come. Um, let's go back to AUKUS itself. Keating is saying that AUKUS puts future budgets in peril. Mr Keating, I should say that $300 billion for eight subs is preposterous, as he put it. Now, some of that money is paid to the US and the UK. How do we know that Australia is going to get value for that colossal sum? Well, firstly, you can take any uh, ability of government, uh, extrapolate it through sure. to the middle of the 2050s. But the number is large, you, nonetheless. Nonetheless, well, it, the it, number it, is large. But, but these numbers that, that people are quoting go yeah. through to the 2050s or over 30 years. And, and as I say, you can take a range of activities of government well beyond defence and you'll get similarly large numbers mm. if you look at them over that period of time. The meaningful... Uh, number which describes the, the cost of this capability is, is about 0.15% of GDP. A, this is not a question over... about cost, this is a question about value, to be precise. Well, sh sure, and, 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 and if we're going to describe the value for money, mm -hmm. we need to understand the cost associated mm -hmm. with it. We're talking about a cost of 0.15% um, of GDP over the life of the program against a defence budget right now which is at 2% of GDP, much less than Britain, much less proportionately than the United States which will grow to 2.2%. Now, when you think about it in those terms and you look at the degree to which this gives Australia a, 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 a transformational leap in terms of our ability to project, um, in terms of the potency of our defence force, uh, this is the most value for money spend within the defence budget that we will make. Um, Australia could end up in a position where it's supporting three different submarines at the same time, the Collins class, the US Virginia and the new AUKUS boat. Uh, I'll ask you to answer this briefly. How is it possible for a new industry, a relatively new industry, to sustain this? 
Well, we've got time. I mean, uh, the, the circumstance which, which may or may not occur that you've described would be in the early 2040s, but you are right uh, that we will at least be running two sorts of uh, submarines. Uh, look, that is a function of, to be honest, the, the, the lost decade that we've had um, uh, during the, the former coalition government, uh, which has given rise to the prospect of a capability gap in the 2030s. Um, and the way in which we, and the only way in which we're able to deal with that capability gap so that we have an evolving submarine capability is by acquiring these Virginias early. Now, we, we, we believe that uh, in the way in which we have structured the, the future submarine that will be built in Australia and in the United Kingdom with more American technology on it, there will in fact be quite a lot of commonality between the two platforms, so we think we can make this work. Um, and, and, and it is manageable, but it is a function of, of the capability gap that was left to us. Let's come back to Mr Keating. Is there now an irretrievable breach between this Labor, Labor government and the party's ranking elder? Is there any coming back from this? Well, look, as, as I said earlier, um, uh, it, whatever Paul Keating says about us, we, we will not be uh, saying a bad word about Paul Keating. I mean, the Hawke Keating government um, is, is one of the great governments of our history, and uh, Paul Keating's legacy in that is completely assured, and he is a revered figure in our movement, and it's really important that he remains as such. But would you, would you, you still know, take a phone that, call? Would you still take a phone call course. from Mr. Keating? Uh, of course, and I, I've had I've had really uh, positive engagement with, with with Paul Keating over a long period of time. But you know, I reiterate the the, the Hawke Keating government finished in 1996. You know, our responsibility is to manage our national interest faced with the national security challenges that we have in 2023 and based on the, the classified and confidential briefings that we get today. And, and they're the circumstances that we have to manage. That's the mandate that we have received and that's the mandate that we will fulfil. Richard Miles, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thanks, Sarah.